Why does the phrase spam describe useless messages? How did thousands of people share information digitally over a decade before the internet as we know it today came into fashion? More importantly, what if I told you that the dream of the internet as a free-for-all of communication, collaboration, knowledge, discussion, and stupidity thrived well before we had websites dedicated to it? This was Usenet. Now, a great deal of what Usenet is, both physically and virtually, is complicated as hell, so I'm going to be simplifying a lot of terms here in order to make things easier to follow. In addition, I simply was not alive in the heyday of Usenet. I'm coming at this purely as a retrospective. It wasn't something I experienced myself. Luckily, for reasons I'll get into later, almost all of Usenet is not only archived, but publicly accessible. Anyway, here's a bit of background. Usenet was the brainchild of Tom Truscott and Jim Ellis, first thought of in 1979 and actualized at 1980. It was, at its core, a piece of software that allowed servers to communicate with each other and was originally established between Duke University and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Later, it would be expanded to many more institutions. The original software was called A-News and bore little similarity to modern-day internet. There were no graphics, no pictures, just text on a console. Users navigated to news groups, which were organized into areas of discussion for certain topics. These news groups ranged from topics such as science and atheism to video games and Star Trek. Basically, anything discussed on Reddit these days. About a year after its creation, Usenet exceeded A News's capacity to keep up with the messaging, and B News, its successor, was created, which lasted many more years. Now, posting on Usenet was a bit like creating a post on an internet forum. You navigated to the news group you wanted to post to, and you put your message out there. To prevent total anarchy, other users would only see your message if they navigated to that news group. Some news groups were moderated by an administrator, who would approve or deny the posts submitted to them, and other news groups were entirely unmoderated, allowing anyone to post anything that they wanted. This second category of news groups was usually designated by the tag alt. For example, alt music or alt science. In these news groups, anyone capable of creating a topic was able to create a topic. As a result, there was a lot of strange and confusing discussion on these news groups, so much so that it was often joked that ALT stood for Anarchists, Lunatics, and Terrorists. Kind of like a more civilized 4chan. That civility, in fact, is important. Usenet started as a way to share files between academia, not as a means of social networking. Early communications looked and felt very much like business-level emails with headers, closers, documentation, and contact info at the bottom, giving most messages a very professional feel, at least in the beginning. The simple reason for this was because most people who used Usenet at the beginning were either college professors or college students, and therefore treated this new medium as though it were the same as writing a letter. As time went on, Usenet's use spread to more and more college campuses and institutes. With more users came more discussion, more news groups, and, well, a lowering of the user base's collective IQ. In fact, shortly after Usenet was created, users began to see floods of useless or worthless content. This was, in fact, the first time the phrase spam was used to describe meaningless content. Now, spam described useless messages posted to news groups, whether the use group users liked it or not. Usenet also gave rise to a term that is, these days, much overshadowed by other terms. The flame, or flamer. A flame was when one Usenet user lashed out at another in an angry or aggressive way, or posted on Usenet with the intent to cause anger. In other words, trolling, at its most base form, originated on Usenet. And believe me, people were just as angry with the internet back in the 80s as they were today. I read a conversation between Usenet users in the Star Trek news group just before the 1982 Trek film Wrath of Khan was released. People were talking about all sorts of rumors surrounding the movie and discussing the trailers. And then one guy pops in and says something to the tune of, Yeah, I saw the pre-screening. Uh, Spock dies. And people lost their shit. Panic, outrage, anger, pain, the entire spectrum of Dabda all could be seen. There were people on both sides of the argument. 
Some claiming that Spock really did die, and others claiming that Spock would never die. N they couldn't let Spock die. That's ridiculous. He did not a chance. The argument was vitriolic, personal, and people were mad as hell. And you know what? Not one of them knew each other outside of Usenet. Usenet brought people together just as much as it divided them. It was the quintessential and original outlet for nerd rage. If you go through the Usenet archives, you too will be able to see the archetype for just about every internet subculture that's around today. The anything goes shock jocks, the defensive and angry nerds arguing about the tiny details in their favorite Transformers episodes, discussion of latest animes, trolls, or as they were called back then, flamers, video game discussion, pop culture news, tech and gadget updates, and well, the list goes on and on. In truth, by the late 90s, when the internet's popularity exploded, there was already a large and existing user base of geeks from all over the world using the web. So, what happened? Well, in truth, Usenet wasn't all glitz and glamour. There were some major problems with the way that files were stored and transferred. Depending on who ran the server that your newsgroup was located on, your message might stay posted for seven years before getting wiped. Or it might last a week. Your information was not permanent, not by a long stretch. It was also easy to spoof your console's address to make yourself sound like someone you're not. Suddenly, anyone could be a professor at Yale and without leaving high school. Incredible. No one would ever do that today, I'm sure. The biggest problem, by far, was ease of use. Or more to the point, the lack thereof. Usenet was not an easy system for the average person to work their head around, especially back in those days when computer use was not a required skill for most workplace environments. And then the web happened, with its pictures and buttons and mouse usage, and suddenly everyone could go on the web. You didn't need to know programming. Google and other search engines provided faster ways to get answers and find things, dedicated news sites took the places of news groups, and file sharing took on a multitude of more easily accessible forms. Usenet still exists today, but the days of conversation, discussion, and news are over. These days, Usenet exists as a file sharing alternative to P2P and torrent networks, with most, if not all, Usenet servers requiring a subscription to access. Even worse, thanks to certain unsavory individuals using Usenet as a way to distribute illegal material, Usenet's functionality has started being dropped by some ISPs entirely, all the way back in the early 2000s, and requires most people to subscribe to a separate, paid service in order to use it. Usenet will never actually die, though, as it isn't a company, but rather just a collection of servers across the world, owned and operated by individuals. But it is certainly still on the decline. So, where can you relive the glory days of Usenet and look through the origin of internet culture yourself? Surprisingly, Google. In 2001, Google acquired a large archive of Usenet messages from another company called Deja News and created Google Groups. Google Groups is basically Usenet with a GUI. It's not a great interface, but at least it has one. Users can log into the site or contribute via email to Usenet groups or start new threads of their own. Kind of like the world's most chaotic and decentralized internet forum. Or if you want to get a bit closer to the old school experience, try going to telehack.org. Telehack is a game that replicates what hacking was like back in the 80s, but they also have a sizable Usenet archive on their site, which you can access by entering Usenet into their console. This will give you a selection of random Usenet messages from any random particular period of time. It's near impossible, via this method, to follow any one particular conversation, but it's a fantastic way of getting a feel for Usenet that simply doesn't exist anymore. It's also accessible by Telnet if you like doing things the hard way. So, that's what happened to Usenet. It's an interesting part of history, often pushed aside by its big brother, the modern internet, but in a strange way, I find it kind of intriguing. It's humanity's first attempt at digital collaboration, and seeing as it had heavy use for the first 15 years or so of its life and continues to exist today, though in a much altered form, I would have to categorize it as a success. In truth, as long as there's one person out there with a server hosting a news group, Usenet will never die, regardless of what it's actually being used for. Usenet is dead. Long live Usenet.